Okay, let's flip the scale inhibitors. Okay, so how did, how did we stop scale formation? Um, basically what we do is we actually, uh, the scientists were pretty good, the chemists were pretty good. They actually invented what they call organic phosphonates. And basically when calcium carbonate forms, it forms in a crystal, okay? And that crystal actually compacts, you know, one on top of the other, forms nice layers, and you get a nice layer of scale formation. It's all usually pretty even. Um, so it forms a nice compact, uh, and they fit in nice little segments, and that's how you grow scale formation. What the phosphonates do is they actually modify that scale. So as calcium and carbonate come together, the phosphates get their finger in there, okay, basically, and they modify that crystal. So now it's not a organized crystal anymore. So it's trying to find a slot for itself. Can't find a slot. Can't find a slot. Eventually gets purged out of the blowdown. So it's, it's basically a crystal modifier is what we do. And if you want to look at it from an electron microscope standpoint, you can see the crystals kind of up in this area here where they're nice cubic in some shapes. There's ones that are starting to form on top of each other. Um, and then, of course, when you modify them with the phosphonates, you can see how they're all distorted and everything else, so they really can't, they can't form a deposit. They basically run around the system and eventually either uh, settle out somewhere or, or go through the blowdown. Scale inhibitors for choice in Seattle. Okay, let's, let's figure out what you should be using. There's a couple different scale inhibitors used around the country. Um, there's basically only two choices that are technically sound for the Seattle water. Um, if you're going to push your high cycles, which are 15 cycles of, of, rec of concentration, I recommend the use of PBTC phosphonate, okay? Basically, this is a phosphonate designed to handle high scaling water, because we're actually making scale, we're actually driving the water to a scale forming state, and so we certainly wanna make sure we don't scale the system. So a PBTC phosphonate blend, most uh, water treatment companies have a polymer they use for suspended solids, and azole, and azole is your copper corrosion inhibitor, and we'll talk about that. If you find that you need additional corrosion protection, if you choose not to run 15 cycles, um, even the 15 cycles you still see some corrosion you don't like. Uh, the other program is what they call HEDP phosphonate plus zinc and then polymer and azole. Now some municipalities restrict zinc, so you need to be aware of that in case that's a problem up here. But basically the zinc is a cathodic inhibitor. It basically forms a cathodic barrier on the steel surface to help protect corrosion. HEDP has the advantage and it kind of breaks down over time, so it breaks down to orthophosphate. So you have some orthophosphate in the system over time, that also is a form of corrosion inhibitor. So I don't think you'll have corrosion problems if you run 15 cycles, my recommendation would be the PBTC, polymer and azole, but if you do need help, certainly there's two programs. If you're running any other type of chemical programs outside of that, you're probably not where you should be on that. Most water treatment companies have these two programs, and these are the two programs of choice, so you're probably already there. Both of these products come in a one-drum formulation. Okay, so you're basically buying one drum. They have the formulation on there, so it's very easy to apply uh, with a small chemical pump and it's based on the controller. Okay, right, corrosion control. Um, we don't really do a whole lot when we have scale-forming water. If you look at water, it either wants to be corrosive, it wants to take minerals to satisfy itself to be stable. Um, there is a point where it's actually stable. These are where the nuclear power plants run. The people that run water out of Great Lakes and run into nuclear power plants for condensers, they can't discharge that water back to the Great Lakes without, with chemicals. They can't discharge it to the groundwater. So what they do is they actually adjust the water quality so it's very non-corrosive, non-scaling, right at that middle point. Now that's difficult to do, uh, they, but they have the time and the resources to do that. Um, or you make the water scale forming. So in other words, the water has, has got so many minerals in it that it wants to give it back to you, okay, at scale. So we can do whatever we want. If we want to make the water corrosive, we can just feed acid and bring the pH down. And that used to be the program of choice back in the early 80s, if you remember chromates. Very inexpensive program. We had pH to bring the water to a corrosive state. We fed chromate for corrosion control. Well, chromates were outlawed in 1987. This is a as a suspected carcinogen. So now what we're doing is we're driving the water up to a scale forming state so it's not corrosive anymore and we're feeding a scale inhibitor. So most of the corrosion control is done by cycling the water up. One of the things that you want to do to make sure that things are going well is put in a corrosion coupon rack. And these are basically racks where we have small pieces of metal strips 
and they're pre-weighed to the fourth decimal point, so there's a known surface area, a known weight, and we actually put them in inside the, uh, the, the corrosion coupon racks, and we actually simulate a three to five feet per second flow, which is what you're seeing through the system normally, and we set that through a water meter where we controls at five gallons per minute. So normally a five gallon per minute rack, one inch rack, will simulate three to five feet per second. And the goal is you pull those coupons out about every 90 days, okay, and you have them clean and reweighed, and that tells you your mill's per year thickness. So it gives you about four or five indications per year before you open up that chiller, so you're not surprised at what you see. And normally what we want, again, again, mild steel should be less than one mil per year, copper less than 0.1, galvanized, if you have a galvanized tower, you should have less than one mil per year on the galvanized too. If you're exceeding those limits, that just gives you an opportunity to make adjustments to the program and find out why before you get the magical surprise when you open up a chiller. One of the corrosion inhibitors is, is, is uh, copper corrosion inhibitors is azol. Okay, this is basically a film former on there for all your chemistry guys. I gave you the, the two molecular chemical formulations right there. Basically, there's two types. There's tolytriazole and benzotriazole. Basically, this is added in the chemical and actually puts a coating, a molecular level coating on the copper surfaces and acts as a barrier. So really the, the corrosive water really doesn't come in contact with the, the pipe surface itself. And we normally want to carry about one to two parts per million of azole in the system on that. Um, so, I guess, so I know that when you get all your service reports from your water treatment suppliers, I'm sure they're going to be a nice little quad that says azole, you know, and they're going to have a nice little number right there and it's going to be in range. If they don't have it there, you should make sure that they do have it there because that is your only source of copper corrosion control. Okay, and the last quadrant we talked about is fouling. Okay, and, and basically, like I said earlier, if you stand next to the cooling tower, your cooling tower acts as a big air washer. Okay, so if you're next to a road or next to a construction site or next to a high dust area like in Phoenix or Vegas, um, there's a lot of suspended solids that comes into the cooling tower um, because it actually cleans the air. That's one of the advantages of it. Unfortunately, the dirt particles go through your system, so it has a chance to be captured on the pipe surface or the heat exchangers, and it also settles in your tower basin. Okay? What we want to do is we want to make sure that we remove or reduce the amount of loading of particulate matter because it's also a transport mechanism for biological activity. It's like they, they hitchhike, grab a ride on it, and they go around the system until they want to settle out somewhere. And of course, you can see the cooling tower base and all the mud and debris and everything else that accumulates in the cooling towers. So in order to remove suspended solids, you have a couple options. One, you can do more blowdown, which is against the, the thought process of trying to conserve water. Um, you can do more tower cleanings, which is certainly recommended by OSHA, or you can look at filtration. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about filtration because there's a segment coming up on that, but one of the things that that you need to look at before you put filtration on there is determine what filtration unit you want to put on there, okay? And there's a couple different filter units uh, that you have a choice of. Um, and this is kind of an a, a industry uh, problem right now because a lot of people are putting on filters that are the wrong filters for the cooling towers, okay? One of the things that you want to do is you want to do what we call a particle size distribution. We have the ability to take a water sample, even as clean as it might be, and run it through a counter, a particle counter, okay? It will actually tell you how many particles you've got in the different micron size capacities. And these are micron is basically the thickness of the particle. It's the width of the particle. So here you have 0.5 to 1 microns, which is 1 one-thousandth of an inch, okay? All the way up to 100 micron. Trivia question. Assuming you have 20-20 vision, do you know what micron size you can see? Anybody gonna take a guess? Zero? I'm assuming 2020 vision, sir. <laughs> Anybody wanna take a guess? Five to 10, anybody else? 20? Anybody higher? 50, getting closer, yeah. Actually it's 40 microns. You, a, a normal 2020 vision can see a 40 micron particle or above. Me, it's about 100 micron. You know, I just, just can't see up close anymore. So you can see that 40 micron, 50 microns is really when you just start seeing a particle, okay? So if you have things like uh, dirt and debris, and bugs, leaves, those obviously are much larger micron size. You can see all that. But look where all the, mic look where all the particles are at in this cooling tower. In the cooling tower here, you have 306,000 particles per milliliter of water. 
in the 0.5 to 1 micron range. At 40 micron, you've got about 90 or less up there. Okay? Filters are rated in micron size. So if you had a 40 micron filter, what do you think your chances are of being an effective filter for this tower? Not very good. Okay. So you need to make sure you do a particle size distribution. Most of the, uh, the most prominent one is the sand filter units. Okay? And then you'll hear more about that a little bit later. The other thing that we have, and probably the best, best thing that has occurred in the water treatment field in the past four or five years is the feed automation. The controllers have really taken a quantum leap in the ability of controlling the chemistry. These meters right now, whether it's a Webmaster, Advantage, or Tracer, or whatever the models you have, now have the ability to do things like connectivity, uh, the blowdown, ORP, which is your biocide feed, some are trace where they can actually measure the chemical level themselves and bring it back into the controller. Um, they have flow switch that lets you know if the system's on or off. They can actually have feed verification on the pumps. Does liquid actually go through the tubing? You know, the controller says, turn on my pump, but how do you know there's chemical going through there? They can actually feed and verify that the water is going through there, or the chemicals are going through there, and everything can be web-based. So you can almost be now at a computer and see your entire water treatment program in there. And that's important because as you, as you push the cycles and as you push the chemistry, you need to make sure you have good automation. So I would encourage each of you to look in that, and it also is, it can take water meter signals and actually calculate how much water you use per day and everything else. And that would be different from, the, from the, um, the, the program that they were talking about earlier. So I would encourage you to look at some of the controllers. They're very good, they're very effective, and they're fairly accurate. Just to give you an example, back in the 80s, you know, we did a lot of manual control. Obviously, you would not think the control was very good. Then we started feeding by bleed. So in other words, as the bleed solenoid valve opened up, we'd feed chemical with a thought process. As you bleed, you lose chemical, so you want to replenish it at the same time. Better control, and then you start feeding it based on water meter or inhibitor trace, we can lock it in pretty close. So the, the, the technology is fairly good on those controllers, and you should look at some of that. Pricing is coming down on that automation, so it'd be worth looking into. Okay, so what's the problem that we see out there with water treatment? Well, back in uh, July, from January to July, we tested 1,188 cooling towers, okay, in our labs. 50% didn't have enough phosphonate for scale control. 30% didn't have enough azole. 18% had excess bacteria count. 90% of the chill water loops did not have the right chemistry. That's not good. The technology is here. The automation is, wow. Then why are we not implementing this program very well? So I guess my question to you is work, work with your water treatment suppliers. Challenge them. Challenge them on that. Adjust the blow down to run your 15 cycles. That should be your homework assignment for tonight or tomorrow. If your water treatment supplier says they can't do that, then change suppliers, basically. Okay. Is there an alternate water source available at your facility that you can use? And rethink about that. You can have that analyzed and see if it's worth, worth bringing it back to the coin tower for the our return on investment is there. Next question is, how's your biocide program? Okay, that's the 90% rule theory. And then certainly reevaluate your water treatment automation program. And I think you guys can amplify your water treatment program, push those cycles the way you should be, get that water conservation, and get some great results. So that's it for me. Any questions?